so welcome and thank you everybody for coming. It's a great turnout. I'm, I'm excited and I'm very nervous. Uh, we're going to talk about crowdfunding and the power of networks. Um, I want to say something about my URL there, where it says about.me slash Liz McClellan. Sounds really um, vain and horrible. <laughs> you don't, it's not really all about me. About me is a service that lets you throw up a page very quickly and very cheaply, in fact, free, uh, to show off your, um, your, your, your different spaces online. So if you have no web page and you want to get online quick, go to About Me, sign up, and you're good to go. Um, it's free and it's fairly easy to set up. So uh, I'd like to encourage people to look at that as a service. All right. Um, so let's try the do All right. <laughs> So uh, I've been in this business for a very long time, and by this business I mean online, networking, technology, web development, design, user interface. I started in user interface, um, and so I kind of want to apologize to all of you for the last 25 years of your experience on your computer, because I know it's been fairly horrible. And for most of you, your relationship to your computer and to the network is fairly antagonistic. Um, uh, I am partially responsible for that, and I am sorry. <laughs> I tried to use a, a pay, what do you, uh, the, the little, um, the thing that you use to check out at DNB, the little computer thing. I used to design those, and I couldn't use it. So I'm right there with you. Um, I do web design, web development, uh, crowdfunding, individual coaching, and planning for crowdfunding and strategy, media strategy for businesses and nonprofits. Um, let's see. All right, so I, I just want to get a temperature of where folks are at. And can everybody hear me? Are you, you, you all right? Okay. So raise your hand if you have a business email account that is separate from your personal account. Okay, we're in good shape. Those two things should never miss. Liz, I think we have surprises. We do. Oh, we do oh, have we prizes. Do. Yes, we do. And we've decided what the prizes, but we're not there yet, right? I got a couple of really small ones. I okay. If that's okay. Okay. Yeah. So who, who, who? Uh, if you don't mind me interrupting, sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, email account. Who uh, has the oldest email account? Uh, what? The oldest email account. When did you get your email? When did you get your first email account? Old. Two thousand three. Two thousand three. Anybody can beat two thousand three? Eighty seven. Eighty seven. That's wow. pretty good. Anybody can beat 87? Thank you. Sure they did. Thank you, Liz. Okay. So, how many of you have a business Twitter account? An account just for Twitter and just for your business. Okay. All right. How many of you have a personal Facebook page? It's just you and your family and friends and people you love and people you found out you kind of love but are really annoyed by. <laughs> um, okay. And how many of you have a business or project or organization? Okay. Uh, now, do you guys manage, do you guys all manage your business Facebook pages or does someone else do it for you? You all do it yourself. That's great. Okay. Now, we did this, uh, Liz, if you don't mind interrupting again, sorry. Okay. Uh, we did this at the last uh, pub talk. Uh, the question is on Facebook. Who has more than 100 likes on your Facebook page? Nice. Who has more than 200? 300. 300. Yeah. 400. 500. 600. 700. This is your business page, not your personal one. Good job. <laughs>
This is how I got my start. I started a um, project called Hyperlocavore. If I could go back in time, I would name it something else because that's a big mouthful. <laughs> um, I was thinking hyper, there was, there was a news thing that was going on at the time called hyperlocal news. So you'd have a paper that was focused only on this block of Baker City, right? Uh, Hyperlocavor was trying to, it's a yard sharing site where what I was trying to do, I was living in an apartment in New York City, I had no place to grow food, I'm a gardener, um, what I wanted to do was find a person with a yard that would allow me to grow food and I would trade them my labor for all the veg I could take home and all the fruit they could take home and that was the idea. And so I turned that into a platform, an idea uh, where anybody in the nation can sign up find people in your neighborhood who might want to grow on your land and, uh, and you don't want, you know, maybe you have a bent bum knee or a bad back. And it's, a, it's a matching service for those kinds of relationships. It took me, um, I started the, uh, thinking about that site in 2008 and when I moved to Halfway, I had a lot of time on my hands so I decided I would make it happen. And so I started thinking about crowdfunding because I was becoming aware of the potential of crowdfunding and platforms, Kickstarter was starting to happen then. And so I started thinking about it and started building relationships and a network online that enabled me to get funded in 2010. And I'll break that down a little bit more. Um, this is one of my favorite platforms, one of the thousands I mentioned before. This is called Patreon. And what they do is they allow uh, content creators and anybody that creates something that um, can be digitally distributed. So music, art, comics, uh, books, anything that can be distributed online. Um, you can sign up with Patreon and let's see, they will find you, um, or hopefully you will build a network of patrons who will give you a dollar per comic book or a dollar per video or a dollar per blog post and if you get enough of those people you have a steady income for doing the kind of creative work that you do or that you, you're good at. So this person here, his name is Destin and he creates um, a video called Smarter Every Day and they're science videos, short science videos on topics that he tries to explain to people in a really friendly, open, basic manner so you could, you know, so you know, oh, that's what the Large Hadrian Collider does. He covers that kind of stuff for, for people like myself who was asleep. Oh, actually, I wasn't asleep. I was making a little band in my biology class of the frogs. That's what I was doing. I wasn't paying much attention. Calipers and rock and roll. Okay, so let's see. This is Change Exchange Northwest, and some of you have heard about this from Lisa at NEODD. I don't know how many O's and D's are in there. A lot. Am I close? You're close. My nickname is Liz Dexic in other circles. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, let's see. So uh, some of you know, uh, you've heard about the Lostine Tavern, which is in Lostine. They're raising money to make a farm-to-table restaurant. Uh, maybe Lisa can update us on where they are in their goal. I think around 20,000. They're at 20,000. Five days to go, maybe. Ten, eight days first, to go. The first of May. First When's of May. that coming up? Very, very soon. <laughs> so, far right. soon. so they had a very large goal, and I was talking to Lisa about it earlier. It was a goal that maybe not realistic with the networks that they had built yet. They sort of it was a hail mary pass, in my opinion, where they had a huge funding goal and hadn't. I don't think personally they'd done the footwork to build the network needed to get to that goal. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you get there. Um, let's see. So I'd like to encourage people to check out Change Exchange. It is a crowdfunding platform that's localized to the Pacific Northwest. So we're all trying to focus on how we stimulate our economy, not the whole economy. All right. Crowdfunding has enabled all kinds of new thinking about how we do things. Um, this is one of the most exciting platforms I've seen. It's called Mosaic. And what they do is they allow all of you to invest in community solar projects. So let's say we decided that um, the parking lot in front of Safeway should have one of those solar parking lots where all the cars are under solar panels and the solar panels are collecting energy to run a daycare center or whatever. Well, I'm not sure what it would power, but 
Community solar is the, is the idea around this, and it's, um, um, it, it's an investment proposition. So for instance, if you wanted to invest in this community solar project for a 6 or 8% return, I'm not sure what the return they're offering is, you could do that to localize uh, energy here and not be buying energy from the market, the national market, international markets, and localizing capital here. So to me, that's a very exciting, very exciting. Anybody dizzy yet? Are we okay? <laughs> okay. So crowdfunders are unleashing human creativity for entrepreneurs, musicians, community activists, kids, do-gooders like me, growers, ranchers, scientists, small business owners, culture hackers, and free-range creatives. Even though post-2008, we had a drying up of capital and a withdrawing of capital from the markets. So people are giving huge amounts, even though other people are not giving huge amounts. <laughs> um, this is one of my heroes, Bucky Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think that's what's happening with crowdfunding. All right, so the old way, this is the slide I had to warn Zella about. I felt, <laughs> Zella's our banker at US Bank, and I said, I'm going to say some things about bankers here. I apologize in advance. But I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Morgan, and Bank of America. Um, and I know a lot of us have felt this way. Uh, a lot of equity has been sucked out of our houses. A lot of risks that we've taken have been taken only by us and not by people that have loaned us money. Um, that's debatable, but uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating relationship for a lot of us. A new way. There are four models. Uh, equity crowdfunding, which is an investment. We're not going to cover that here. That's more the territory of NEODD and uh, Amy Pearl's group. Peer-to-peer -peer loans. Uh, so you guys all forming a collective and loaning each other out at an interest. There are platforms for that. Jeff, I need 10 bucks. <laughs> so, so, so Prosper is a good example of that. Uh, you can decide as an investor you want to put in $200 to Prosper and they will loan it out to um, local businesses, and maybe not local to here, but, uh, and, and give you a six to 10%, 12% return, which is a really good return in this market. I mean, it's kind of an amazing concept, I think. Um, Are all of these backed by some sort of insurance like security? No. For the risk, that's why you're doing Right. So, so this, is, this is beyond my can in terms of I don't want to be giving you financial advice. Um, but any of these platforms, if you're going, if you're going into an equity investment, you probably have to be a qualified investor, meaning you probably have to have over $250,000 in the bank and an income of, you guys can probably tell us. Um, so for the investment um, stuff at large amounts, they're pre-qualified investors. Sure. So there's a lot more detailed stuff to go in there. Um, Prosper is a different thing. You know, you're probably not loaning out hundreds of thousands. You're, you might be loaning out 500. So I think there's probably less barrier to entry if you wanted to try that out. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer loan, that's like Prosper. Pre-sales is when you have a, it's a I, Pebble might have worked as a pre-sale, where you have a great idea for a product, and you know that product, if offered, people would buy it ahead of time and fund you the money to get it made. So for instance, if you have a magical bottle opener that's the newest, best bottle opener ever, and it's got a design that just sends people to the moon, you could put that on Kickstarter pre-sell them for 30 bucks and get your investment that way. So we're not really covering that, but that's another way to think about crowdfunding. And the last one we're gonna talk about is gift and reward, and that's the stuff I've been doing. Um, because it's a gift and because the rewards are not uh, money, um, it's much less technical and it's much less um, sticky with the SEC. So. We'll be talking about that. Um, so the, the two platforms I've been using are Kickstarter and Indiegogo. GoFundMe, I'll mention, is another platform aimed at uh, personal needs. So for instance, 
someone has to have an operation that can't get covered, they might do a GoFundMe um, uh, fundraiser to, to, rate, to cover their operation or a wedding or a, you know, a personal needs. So that's something to look at if, if, if you have a personal uh, need that way. But we won't be really covering that. All right, so the power of the new model. 2.7 billion in 2012. Anyone want to take a guess at to what it was around 2013? No guesses? Ten. Uh, uh, ten would be nice. <laughs> Whoops. More than one percent. More than one percent. Excellent. 5.1 billion estimated. That's a pretty big number. Okay. Uh, Congress and President Obama passed the Jumpstart. Uh, our business startups or Jobs Act in 2012, which made equity legalized equity crowdfunding. And as these guys said, the, the laws are still being written and all the details are still being worked out. But the amount of energy, the amount of excitement that is unleashing in terms of um, new business designs, new product ideas, new ways of doing things is tremendous. And 5.1 billion is just the start as far as I'm concerned. It's tiny, tiny, tiny in comparison to where it's going to go. All right, so tapping in, easier than ever. You probably don't feel like this. You don't feel wired to the internet, right, with the plugged in and, and the, a, a digital native. I don't. I've been on it 26 years, and I'm still not that way. Probably more like this, right? <laughs> uh, like I said, things have shifted. We've gotten better at these designs and better at these tools. All right, so let's start with design. It really matters, right? First impressions mean a lot. And people only give you a few seconds. Um, bad design can turn people off your campaign. It can turn people away from your project. Uh, cutting hair, it is not a job for your cousin who dabbles. Uh, you want to be really careful with design and with your logo and with your identity. It is the first thing people see, right? Some of these are instantly recognizable. You know where that is, right? You know, in fact, you probably know exactly where to stop on the way to Boise. Anyone know who this guy is? No? Walt. Who said Walt? <laughs> Walter White from Breaking Bad. Um, probably a reference I shouldn't have used because not everybody watched the show. But very identifiable fellow. This is our logo for my project. Um, I got that done for about a hundred bucks. I crowdsourced it, meaning I hired somebody from Brazil to do it at a fairly low rate. And it's it's done me well. It's it's, uh, it's identifiable. It's pretty clear. Can you guys? You probably can't read it in the background. I'm imagining. It says Hyperlocavore, a yard sharing community, because everyone loves a homegrown tomato. So pretty happy with that. This, on the other hand, is an example of kind of a bad design. It doesn't say much. Um, I made it small, but the print was small to begin with. It doesn't stand out the way the other three do. So you want to think about your design and your impact as being immediate and visual if possible. So use a designer. It's a profession. <laughs> Takes years to master, just like this tool. <laughs> We can do this. We can totally do this. All right. Kind of. No, 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 we can't. We can. We can. All right. I just wanted to get you a good look at Superman. All right? So, a good Superman. This is a good Superman, as opposed to the previous Superman who didn't really care about how he came across. This Superman cares about how he comes across. Anybody know what the S stands for? Hope. Hope. Exactly. Hope. Um, we learned that in the last Superman. Did we yeah, learn that in the yeah, original yeah, comic book, or did we learn that just in the movie? In the movie. In the movie. <laughs> are there any? Are there? Yeah. Not where I come from. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's a little problematic. All right. So I want, my slide is a little strange. Um, the last one says, "Why is expense?" This is a good place to spend a little money to get it done. All right. So let's think about your network. Um, you're online, you're not online, you're kind of online, you're going to get online. The people you're going to connect with are really important. 
The easy ones are your family, generally speaking, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> your friends, old and new, colleagues, past and present. Online friends who share your values. This is a really important one. Um, people make connections online based on their values and their passions. Um, there are communities that form around Superman action figures. <laughs> you know, I'm not one of them. I'm not a big fan. Uh, there are communities that form around uh, local food, for instance. That's one that I'm very much part of. Or music. That's one we tapped into to get the Pine Fest fundraising done. Your customers, obviously. So your customers at the CSA for Eagle Creek. And small, bo small business owners with a local first focus. That is you guys. You guys should be each other's network. You should be entangling yourselves in each other's success as much as possible. All right, so how big is your network reach? This is my Facebook profile, or my uh, LinkedIn profile. It's a little brief uh, summary of, of what I do on LinkedIn. I have 315 connections there. Um, about 100 of them are people I know and have worked with. Other people I have connected with via discussions online, um, passionate discussions online about sustainability, technology, uh, crowdfunding, all kinds of stuff. And so I don't actually let everybody into my network because I want a qualified network of people who um, or have worked together or thinking in the same direction, right? So I have 315 first degree connections, which means I have almost 8 million second and third degree connections. And 221,000 new people joining that network since March 10th, 2014. So it's nuts. This is the power of networks. So when I say I have 315 connections, about 200 of them are real connections, uh, the, second degree, the second degree connections are people I can connect with through one of my 300. So uh, Bob knows Joe, and Joe has this thing he does, and he's really good at it. So I am, that Bob is a second degree connection. Third degree connection is Bob's brother who makes knives, <laughs> and I need a knife. So he's another connection, but he's farther out. He's a very weak tie. Stronger ties are the close, close in, the 300. Weaker ties are the people out at the third degree. First degree is your best friend. Second degree is your best friend's sister. Third degree is your best friend's sister's boss. Right? So that makes that, that 8 million number. And they're all on Facebook and they're all on Twitter. You hope. So adding them up. I'm going to go through the platforms that I'm on now, and I won't get into how I use them or why I use them. I use them for different reasons, doing different things. But I'm on LinkedIn. I have a, a personal Facebook page, a business Facebook page. My business Facebook page I just set up. There's 15 likes on it. Uh, I have a Twitter account for Hyperlocavar, which was that project. I have a Twitter account for Liz Am Strategy, which is crowdfunding and web development. I have about 3,000 members on my Hyperlocavore social network. I have about 900 on Hyperlocavore's Facebook page. Google Plus I won't get into. I'm not using it that heavily. Uh, YouTube, I have a YouTube account. Quora and Pinterest. Quora is a really interesting platform. It's a place where people go to give and receive serious answers about serious questions. So you've been online, I'm sure, and you've been in these conversations where People are just saying all kinds of stuff, and it's really embarrassing for everyone involved, right? They're, they're arguments, they're not friendly, they're not useful. Cora is different. Cora is where people go to uh, impact each other in a helpful manner. People are working very hard to be of service to Cora, to the community of people asking questions on Cora. And Pinterest, which some of us have used, which is a, a visual storyboard, and I use it a lot for. Um, just thinking visually, um, speaking to people visually. Not everything can be said with words, uh, so I use Pinterest for that. So with all these added up, I have about 21,000 first degree connections. I would say of those 21,000, I probably know 150 to 200 people face to face, and probably 50 of those people well. <laughs> wow. So. 
put the second and third degree connections, connects me to 500 million people, which I'm not making that number up. It's, it's the addition of those, the, the following out of the logic of the 315 to the, the previous number. Sorry, I'm drawing too many numbers at you. Let's see. Less than 3% of that 500 million will give, and that's still a really big number. Yeah. Yeah. A very small percentage of those people will follow through, like my page, and give, should I make a request on a fundraising campaign. So this may seem quite intimidating. How do you connect to those people, right? It's all numbers. How do you how do you involve yourself in their lives, and how do you get them involved in your life? How far does this network reach? Well, this is Japanese astronaut Commander Koichi Wakata. He has web set, web access, and he's 220 miles above the Earth. So basically, anywhere on Earth and beyond, people are connecting to the internet. How to connect. All right. Be yourself. And in my case, that means occasionally I swear. <laughs> and it's turned out to be OK. I don't do it all the time, but it does happen. I think there might be three or four people that have been following me because of it, but most people just know that occasionally she does that. Be yourself. Share your passions and your values, who you are and what you care about. Don't fake it. Don't uh, pretend to care about things you don't care about. Don't, uh, don't, don't be just another person presenting a supremely professional and um, opaque persona online that no one can penetrate. Be yourself. And take the knocks, you know? Some, some people will love you, some people won't love you so much. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's just the way it is. Um, share your knowledge. Be helpful. Share your connections. Introduce people to each other. Uh, give more than you take. Build mutuality and build trust. These are all individuals I've connected with online. Each one of those faces is on Twitter. Uh, and each one of those persons is an individual who has a whole life and a whole story and their own passions and their own values. And you're not connecting with a name. You're not connecting with an email. You're connecting with a human being. So always approach it that way. Trust is becoming transparent along with reputation. A lot of us know what small town life is, right? If you have a reputation, it travels, right? Well, now that is happening online. Your reputation goes with you wherever you go. There are, uh, some of these tools are coming online, like Trust Cloud, for instance. Trust Cloud basically takes an assessment of how I've interacted online in things like eBay. Do I pay quickly? Do I deliver quickly? Uh, am I responsive when people email me? Am I responsive in, in uh, private messages? Trust Cloud is, is assessing all of those things, and so I get a score based on how I'm interacting with people online. Whether or not this is a good thing depends. Integrity matters. So this is uh, on LinkedIn. People start to, let's see, um, people start to assess your skill set. So I can't zoom in. I'm a little worried about that. But uh, you, you start to get people assessing you on your skill set, the things you do. People will now say, ah, you know, she's great at that. She does that well. This has a double-edged sword. Mess up online, and people will know about it. I'm sure you've heard of many of the Twitter disasters where people have done, and, or social media managers have done and said things that companies really regret. So be really careful, because bad news travels fast, just like in a small town. <coughs> this is not the lottery, all right? It doesn't, it's not about having a great idea and then rolling around in money. It takes a lot of work. Um, one of the things that people tend to do is uh, spray and pray. Like, so they've built up their network. They've got thousands of friends that they don't really have a relationship, but they've linked up. And then they blast that list with a request for a donation or a request for support on a crowdfunding campaign. This doesn't go over very well. Because you haven't built a relationship with those people, it's seen as just 
just another crowdfunding request. And there are so many of them that people only give to things and people that they care passionately about. So you need to make people care passionately about you by caring about them. All right, to make your goal, to get to where you want to be, you will need real values, right? Your own values, what's important to you, real value in your product. You're offering something that, that people really want, like that Pebble watch. That's a real value to a lot of people, apparently. $10 million, people thought it was valuable. I still have no idea why, but it was real value to those people. Uh, your project should be very specific. Don't think of it as a way to save your business if it's having problems anyway. If you have a specific pro a project that will elevate your business and take you to the next level, that's a good use of crowdfunding, right? That's a way to uh, get there. If, um, for instance, it worked very well with the uh, Eagle Creek Orchard because they had a need for this very specific system to keep their frost protection going, and it worked very well. Um, you're, you should have realistic funding targets. We were talking about Lostine Tavern earlier. Their target was very, very large and, in my estimation, unrealistic for the time they have. I mean, I hope they make it. They might still make it. Let's all help them get there. In fact, go home. Donate a dollar, get them there. But their ask was very, very large compared to the, the group of people they were able to ask. You need that real network online, which I've talked about. You need a track record of trust, a marketing plan, and time to make it happen. So when you're thinking about this, I want you to think not in six months, I want you to think a year, two years. You're starting now for something you're going to be doing two years from now. The ask is gonna come two years from now, or a year from now, not three months from now to save your, your baby, right? It is work, it takes a lot of time. You are the spark. You are the only person that cares about this uh, as much as you do. No one else is going to be as engaged as you are. And maybe you lucked out in the family realm, like you've got people who are really supportive around you, or maybe not. <laughs> You do have your true believers. And what I'm gonna have you do is go home and think about who those true believers are. You need to start thinking about them now and make that list because when you start your crowdfunding campaign, you're going to go to them first. And you're going to ask them to put up 30% of your campaign before you even go public. So on day one, your true believers, who you've cultivated and talked to and begged, are going to be there donating your first 30 percent. The reason you do this is it's a very magic number. If you reach 30 percent of your goal in the first 10 days of your campaign, the odds go up to 90 percent of you making your whole campaign. So that is the magic number and you want to work for it so that on day one it's there. These guys are your fire starters. And as fire starters, you need to meet with them personally. You need to engage them in that first, uh, that launch, that blast off, and let them know how important they are to the success of the whole campaign. You want to invite them maybe to a private group, an email group, where you guys talk about how the campaign's going, what's going on, how they can extend the network and bring more people in. All right, so you've done that. You've got your first 30%. You're off to a great start. Things are going amazing. And then, you've got time left. You're only 80% funded. Zero clicks. No movement, no wind. This happened to me in the hyperlocavore thing, and I'm just like, <laughs> it was horrible. It's the worst feeling in the world, but you can, you, you can assume it's gonna happen. Those are the doldrums. And they don't feel good. They feel horrible. But, if you do it right, you're only a little anxious. You're not too worried. You know what's going on, you know you have a plan. You're basically this guy. You're this guy. Why are you this guy? Because he knows what he's doing. And he knows what he's doing on that 10 day out point of time where 
uh, it's very unclear whether or not the campaign is going to succeed or not. This guy is your ace in the hole. You've made a plan with him or her that when you're at 80% of your goal, they will either make a big donation, they will carry you over to 100%, or they will make an offer to double any donations that come in. You've planned ahead for this person to come in and save your bacon, and they're in on the game. They want you there, they want you to succeed, and they are there for you. All right, so why do people give? I called up all the people that made big donations to the Hyperlocavore campaign, and I asked them, you know, why did you do that? I mean, I was grateful, but I wasn't sure why. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a great idea, but why did they? So this is Eric. I found out recently he's an astrophysicist, which is interesting. Um, he followed me on Twitter in 2009. He shares my local food values and, and is working on a local food project of his own. He's one of my largest donors. I'm sorry, guys. One of my largest donors. He said, I liked what you were trying to do, and you yourself were very personally compelling. So I made a connection with this person on Twitter, and I don't really know how, except that I was myself, which means I was complaining about the canceling of Caprica one night, <laughs> um, posting all sorts of stuff about local food, uh, basically just being myself online. We've never met. This is Bruce McNaughton from uh, Prince Edward Island. This is Bruce McNaughton, uh, Nova Scotia. He uh, owns a Prince Edward Island Preserve Company, which it, uh, is a local food company. Uh, we met on Twitter. We share those local food values and a love of all things Scottish. He, uh, he's an entrepreneur who believes in Main Street, even if it's not in his country and is very far away and is much more uh, is here. And he is also one of my biggest donors. I've never met him either. So why did Bruce give? He said, I was intrigued with your passion and what you were trying to do for your community. I thought it was worthy of my support. We can think of the world as our community, as we are all better off when we do what we can to help others. Bruce has gone on to, form, to do his own project. He raised, uh, crowdfunded a, to build a house, which was to serve uh, critically ill um, people and their families. It's a place to retreat for um, uh, families who have a dying family member. And he made it happen. So it's beautiful. I mean, the pictures are just beautiful. I should have shared them, but I was, my slides were, I had too many slides. Uh, and this is Rowan Barber from Australia. He works with Engineers Without Borders and the Australian Sustainable Business Group. We met on Twitter in 2009. Uh, again, we share vision and values about local food and sustainable business. Also, one of my biggest donors. He said, I liked your guard chain concept. I hoped it would work. I wanted to see if it was scalable, an idea that might take off nationally and internationally. So he connected with an idea. He connected with a, a set of values. Um, and that's what made him give. I've never met him. This is Mike Chinowski. I'm going to say that's probably how you say it. Um, I used to work at a place called Inform, which was a, a, a nonprofit in New York City. And I hired Mike to do some database contracting with me. We stayed connected via LinkedIn. He saw me post about Hyperlocavor, and he loved it, and he became my biggest donor and my biggest supporter, like, out of the blue. I, I have spent maybe two and a half hours with this gentleman face-to-face, -face. and uh, he's, he's terrific. He's a wonderful, wonderful person who's continued to support the idea. I already knew you from the past, and I care about your cause and what you're trying to do. The cause itself matters a lot, however, having a personal contact makes a difference. So he knew me. Alright, so the question is, are you ready today to start this? Do you have a brand and a logo? Are you immediately identifiable? Are you on social media? Are you part of values-based networks? So for me, that's the local food network. Those are people concerned with local food. Um, for Pine Fest, it was people concerned with working musicians and bringing music to small towns like we did in Pine Fest. Uh, do you know who those true believers would be? Those people would come in with that first 30%. Uh, 
Are they all active online and off? Both are important. We need advocates offline to get people online. Uh, are they on board for blast off? Are they ready to go day one? And who's your ace in the hole? Who's the person that's going to come in and save your bacon should things get a little dodgy? This takes time. When I started for uh, to do Hyperlocavore, I started in 2008 thinking about it, and I didn't make my ask until 2010. So that's a long spread. You don't necessarily have to be as cautious as I was. The Eagle Creek Orchard people were not as cautious because they had that network, but think in that, that space of time. I'll leave you with this idea. Pronoia. The sneaking suspicion that the world is conspiring on your behalf. <laughs> I'd like to thank Jean for inviting me. This was a pleasure and a very nervous making, but a real pleasure. And I'm open for questions and answers. Yes, sir? How, how much time do you spend a day in, in this kind of communication? Not a fair question. I'm an addict. All right? <laughs> yeah, um, I am online, you're not going to like this answer, I am online from when I get up to when I go to sleep. And that's, that's all the time. But that really is because I'm an addict. I'm connecting to people around ideas and I really care about talking about ideas. I'm an ideas person. And yeah, you don't need to do that. You do not need to be me to, 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 to hire me to do that. You can't. You can't well, hire me to do that. You can't hire me to do that, um, and it's but it's not necessarily a requirement. But building a real network does take time. Yes. Um, when you said that there was a time deadline for like the Lost Team Bar, and they wanted to make a restaurant, did they set that time deadline, or is that something that's already in place? Yeah, um, some platforms, uh, so Kickstarter is a, is a deadline-driven tool. If you don't raise your money within the 45 days, you don't get a dime, right? In fact, you, have to, I still, you still have to pay some service charges. Um, Indiegogo and other platforms are open, so you can raise as much as you possibly can, and it doesn't actually end. Um, but you, there, is some, there is some advantage to having a time-bound campaign. It keeps the enthusiasm high, and it keeps your energy high for getting it done. If you let that energy dissipate, you're the only driver, so. So with Eagle uh, Fortunes, did they do go through the Kickstart? They used Indiegogo, actually. Indiegogo? Right. So these aren't, these aren't loans you pay out? No. Well, these are people. Because they like your idea, because they like you, because they think what you're doing needs to happen. So for instance, Hyper Loco War I think appealed to a lot of people noticing food was getting really expensive and, and they wanted people to have access to land and so it was a value-driven value, value -driven campaign. They wanted that to happen. Some people, some, 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 some campaigns are driven strictly by the need for an awesome product. So there was the Nest thermostat thing which you guys can look into that's a really cool product that um, helps you manage your energy bill. So that seemed like a really needed thing. And so people enthusiastically threw money at it to make it happen. Other things are fan-based. So for instance, there are, um, so the, the biggest example recently is the Veronica Mars movie remake. Some people know the show Veronica Mars. I'm not a fan, but the fan base, uh, the fan base made that film happen, basically. They loved that character so much that they made a film happen. So that's in the creative realm, but you can think of it in terms of any project, anything that needs to get done. If you find your thousand true fans, you can get it done. But you need to find those fans and friends. Did, did that watch place, if you gave like so much, like let's say $100, you got a watch? Yeah, so with most of these campaigns, they're, they're perk or reward, reward based. So you, you offer perks at different levels. You have to be careful for what kind of perks you offer because that can be very expensive. People often forget to think about mailing, so don't make your perks large. <laughs> if at all possible, make them very, very tiny. <laughs> um, some, some perks are experiences you can offer to people. Um, so, so think in terms of non-material perks as well. 
Let's say uh, you got a business, a uh, family run business, health club, whatever, right. and you want to expand it to like a uh, public relations type place where you do event, family events and stuff like that. Uh -huh. And you need to bring your business uh, into the new age uh -huh. with that. Uh, you're, you're building your whatever you Can you do interactions with people to uh, like solar people? Exchange programs or a funding thing to bring your place up to standards plus promote public relations for people who want to do weddings and stuff like that. Yeah, um, well, so crowdfunding is always good for raising your profile as a business. So there's there's that aspect of it. It's actually it's marketing. It's a way to market. Um, what I would caution you in, uh, about is not having a very specific goal. So if you thought, um, let's say that uh, uh, rowing machines were the new hotness, right? I'm just pulling something out. I don't really know. I haven't been to a gym in a very long time. <laughs> um, but let's say let's say rowing machines are the new hotness, or you want a, a, a spin spin room, right? With 20 spin machines and a nice new video thing, and you know that this is going to rock, skyrocket your business. If you can make that business case to the network that you've built, sure. But you need to be able to make that business case. This is why I caution people not to think of this as a Hail Mary pass, not to think of it as a way to, um, if your business is like this, and you think you're gonna crowdfund your way out of going down, don't think of it that way. Crowdfunding is really something to use to expand a business that is doing pretty well already, or to expand a creative person who's doing pretty well already. For instance, I mean, there's a lot of people on Patreon who, um, I mean, it's just, it's a little sad. It's like, you know, they, they uh, I won't say who, but there's some really bad comic book artists on there who have a hope and a dream, and, you know, they're hoping that people will pay them to make comic books. And, and you know, I just want to say, you need to get much better at making comic books before you ask people to be um, paying you to do that. But <laughs> so, so you know, be careful about what you ask for. Be very careful about what you ask for. It's also a question of integrity. It's an question of, question of integrity for the whole model of crowdfunding. You know, you're you're also needing to be responsible to everyone that's asking. So there will be. Um, crowdfunding disasters. There will be cons and scam artists and people who do a bad job of it. But this is really the goose that laid the golden egg. This is something that can help every small business person, every creative, every uh, small town to get things done. So be aware of your role in that and be ethical and be come to it with integrity. Any other questions? Thank you so much.